Um, oh man, I, I had such high hopes for that being a great savings of, of writing, but I think, well, it's a savings of writing, it's a loss of, of concept, so I'm going to write out the norm of W sub J, F sub value of S sub J, minus B sub J. And then what I do is I just bring in, using the absolute homogeneity um, of the norm, I rewrite this as being less than or equal to 1 over the norm of Wj, the norm of Fj minus Bj times Wj. Now notice that I've gone from looking at the absolute value of a real value function to the norm of a sp the, the, the jth vector component. And then my argument is just basically that that is less than the norm of the whole difference. This is part of this, but it's just one part. So certainly that's less than or equal to 1 over the norm of Wj, norm of f of x minus d, where I just used All right, so now I think we can prove what we wanted to prove in the forward implication, which was what? That each of the limit functions, e each of the component functions has a limit, and it's just the jth component of the limit. So, thus, the absolute value of f sub j, oh, sorry, I already broke that. Let epsilon be greater than zero, and choose delta greater than zero such that what? Such that the absolute value, uh, excuse me, the norm of f of x minus b is less than epsilon times the absolute value of wj. Why can I do that? The reason I can do that is I have supposed that the limit of the vector value function exists and is equal to b. That means I can make it as close as I want to be by choosing delta sufficiently small. In particular, I can make it with an epsilon times l sub j the length of the jth vector. And if I do that, that then says that the, um, if, if you have zero less than the norm of x minus a um, less than delta, well that implies that the norm of f, the absolute value rather, of f sub j minus b sub j of x uh, is less than epsilon times the norm of Wj by our previous argument, but then by our choice of, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm skipping. Duh. What did I prove? So it's less than 1 over, equal to 1 over the norm of Wj um, times the norm of f of x minus b, right? But again, this we chose to be less than what? epsilon times the norm of Wj, so the norms of Wj cancel, and you just get epsilon. Which shows you the forward implication. That shows you that, that, that we've just proved, for the moment, we've proved that 1 implies 2. Right? Now, my claim is that you can go the other way as well. That direction is actually easier. But I'll just pause for a second in case you guys have questions. Other than, why are you doing this? <laughs> oh, you're trying to you're trying to get me back to Spencer, are you? Uh huh. Oh, okay. <laughs> Basically, the point is this. If we have this limit um, for the vector value function exists, then we can prove that the limit of each component function exists because we can choose it for h epsilon greater than zero. We can get close enough to the limit point such that we can guarantee that the difference between the jth component function, which is a real number, and bj, which again is just the real component of b, in the, in the in the jth direction of the basis for w, that, that particular component is less than epsilon. So like, that proves that the limit of the component function exists 
and is just the jth component of the of that limit. The um, converse direction. Converse direction of this. So what do we do? We assume that all of the limits conversely suppose that the limit as x goes to a of f sub j of x is equal to b sub j for j equals to 1, 2, da 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 m. By the way, there was nothing specific about the j in my last argument, so it held for all j. I mean, you could just as well have done that argument for 1 or 2 or 3 or, or m. Now suppose that the limit of each component function exists. Then um, what I can do and what I can do then is I can say, okay, well, let epsilon be greater than zero and um, choose delta sub j greater than zero such that what? such that the absolute value of f sub j minus b sub j is less than epsilon divided by the norm of wj, the length of the jth basis vector times m, whenever what? Zero is less than norm of x minus a is less than delta j. Okay. I can do that for each j, right? Now, I'm greedy. I want these conditions to hold for every single j. So what I do is I, I take delta to be the minimum of all of these. That way I get this condition for each j, for 1 through m. So I, I say, okay, so I'm going to let delta equal to the minimum of delta 1 through delta m and um, let x be an element of v such that 0 less than the norm of x minus a less than delta then if I consider the norm of f of x minus b, right, well, that's equal to the norm of the sum, j equals 1 to m of f sub j of x minus b sub j times wj, because that's the basis expansion of, of the function, the, the, the mapping on this linear, norm linear space. And then I just use the triangle inequality in the usual properties of the norm to simplify this. This gives me less than or equal to the sum j equals 1 to m of the absolute value of x of j minus b of x, of course, minus b sub j um, times the norm of wj, the final inequality in absolute homogeneity, m fold times. But what did we assume about, we, we chose delta so that it's it's less than delta 1, delta 2, del all the way delta dm. So I, I have that every one of these things is smaller than this. So this is less than or equal to the sum j equals 1 to m of epsilon divided by the norm of wj, uh, m times the norm of wj. You can see why I was almost chickening out and coming up with a symbol for the norm of wj, but I have to admit, it kind of needs to be there conceptually to see what's going on. So these cancel, and epsilon is just a constant. What happens when you add a constant? Epsilon over m is a constant. What happens when you add it m, m times? And what? Multiply by m, right? So it's m times epsilon over m. Yeah, it's, it's yes. <laughs> Your guess that it works out to epsilon is a good guess to make, <laughs> if you trust my, if you trust my skills which may or may not be advisable, but there it is. So that shows, therefore, the limit as x goes to a of f of x is equal to b. So aha, we have it, that we can interchange the, this is, I, I refer to this as the vector limit problem. It means that if you have a vector valued function, it suffices to, to, to look at each component function one at a time, and you can piece those together and nothing is lost. Right. This is a statement about the range of the function. It is not a statement about the domain. What you cannot do for multivariate limits is like separate it into different dimensions of the domain. 
that it just doesn't work out. The multivariate limit is just nasty. You can't take a two-dimensional limit and break it down into path limits. You can't just, well, if I approach from the x and I approach from the y, that's enough information to tell me how it approaches in the general directions. There's just, there's a subtlety here which can't be, uh, you know, avoided. But let me show you that, actually. So to give you a sense of my notes, um, what the structure is of them, I, I basically have the, the I, I'm only, only asking you to read chapter two for the moment. Like the next homework, I'll ask you to read chapter three. But you probably, well, maybe I should put chapter three on there too. You probably need to read chapter three in order to make sense of the, um, some of the questions. Again, you only need to do two thirds of the homework. You pick the two thirds you're most interested in. All right. And um, uh, I think the first one probably should be due next Tuesday, but I'll work with you guys if you know you have a problem with that. I just I have found that adding time just pushes back the time people start working on it. So, um, yeah. at least that's what Bailey told me. So you can blame her. She's like, when you add extra time, people don't like work on it harder. They just put it off. I'm like, but when I was given extra time, I worked on it harder. <laughs> but yeah. Ah. Well, I am open to giving you more time if you're halfway through a problem and you really just want to work on it more. Like, that's fine with me. Up to the time we get to a test, right? I mean, I know this, this class may not be your top priority, and I'm willing to work with you on that. That's, that's fine. I mean, I, I, I know. I just, um, well, I want us to all learn as much as we can and not go crazy. <laughs> so here's what I'm talking about. This, this in the plane, if you're talking about the limit as you approach, you know, if you talk about the limit as you approach the origin, if you look at like lines, they, there you um, they all I think go through zero. Um, uh. But th yeah, the lines all go through zero as it happens. But if you start looking at parabolic paths through the origin, some of them go to one, some of them go to minus one. So you see, even if you look at all, if you, if you have a family of curves, all possible lines going to zero, that's not enough information to say that the limit of a function of two variables goes to zero. Because it could be that parabolas do something else. You're like, well, what if you have all parabolas? There are examples that all parabolas go to zero, but when you start looking at cubic functions through the origin, those get hinky. It's, it's really, really subtle. The, 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 the distinction between the domain and the range could not be more, more profound. What I just proved for you is you can break the range into pieces. You can do it one piece at a time. You cannot do that for the domain. It is a fundamental difference between one variable and many variables. Like, um, that's just the nature of the beast. So the start of the notes, if, as you're reading chapter three, I'm, I think I'm just gonna leave it basically as it is. At the start of the notes, I just discuss uh, continuity and um, limits in Rn. And then about midway through the chapter, I define the normed linear space, and then I prove the theorems I've been proving in here <coughs> today. And then at the end of the chapter, I've got this section on all the, the deeper theorems of calculus one that maybe you forgot. Now, if you're a math major, you should read that. If you're an engineer, it doesn't matter, okay? Um, if you're a math major, you should read it because you'll be tested on it again pretty soon when you take like subject tests and stuff like that. Um, but you know, it's stuff like Bolzano's theorem and, and the intermediate value theorem. Um, but here's what I want to show you. The, um, the, well, first of all, the vector of the limits proof in the context of mappings from Rn to Rm is simpler because you don't have to fuss with the basis. So if you look at the proof of Proposition 2.1.8 and compare it to what we did today, just now, you'll see it's, it seems vastly simplified. That's because we have the standard basis to work with as opposed to this beta basis which we were fighting with, right? And maybe I still don't have a completely pr right proof because of that one step. Now, then um, <coughs> what I do is I prove that the sum and product functions are continuous, all right? Um, sum and product functions, they're functions from R2 to R. Like, what's the sum function? You take x and y, it maps to x plus y. Product function takes x, y, and maps it to x times y. I prove those are continuous by epsilon delta arguments in here. These almost certainly can be simplified, especially the product one. Min simplified it, I just forgot what he said, all right? 
But my point to you is the arguments here, simplified or not, can be easily adapted to the context of real valued functions of a normed linear space. So if you accept that, we then have a proof that if you have a product of real valued functions from a normed linear space or a sum of real valued functions from a normed linear space, if those functions are um, continuous functions, then the resulting product is continuous and the resulting sum is continuous. So all of a sudden we've got like everything we could ever want. Basically, if you have some function um, on a normed linear space and, and, and the component functions are continuous functions of a real variable, and the formula is just built from products and sums of continuous functions of a real variable, the resulting function on a normed linear space is also continuous with respect to the, the norms on the linear space. That's, that's the net result of what we proved today says. And that, that might seem like a small thing to you, but you, you could then do things like prove, for example, that the um, general linear group of matrices is an open set. How would you do that? Ah, it's 1230. All right, well, I'll have to wait for next time. Curses, I was hoping I, would got, I got to differentiation today, but I mean, I am close. But anyway, your first homework doesn't have any differentiation on it, so. And if you're not turned on by the first homework, it's okay. Although, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to add a really neat problem for the engineers. I think you guys will like it. It's a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem for, for surfaces. What it says is the following, you guys. If you, in three dimensions, if you have a parallel parallelogram out here in space, the area of this parallelogram, all right, it will be the sums of the squares of the areas of the shadows of the parallelogram onto the coordinate planes. If you take the shadow onto the xy plane, the shadow onto the yz plane, xz plane, and the shadow onto the the yz plane, the, you know, the, the areas of those projections squared will be equal to the area of the parallelogram the area, like, yeah, surface area, it's a parallelogram, so it's just, you know, you can pick the corners, base height, blah, blah, blah. So I, I will, I'll put that on your first homework. It's, I don't know. Did you see that in Calc 3? No. Oh right, the the triple product identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I don't I I don't think I do that in Calc three because it's well it's it would be it would be wrong. But um, actually this generalizes to n dimensions. There's something there. Anyway. Oh, you, you, I guess we're done for today. You can cut it off. Thanks.